Um, thank you to everyone who has joined. Um, my name is Anna and I'm part of the team here at the Oxford Professional Education Group. Um, please could you all just note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, that way we can send it out to you afterwards so you can watch the recording and we'll put it on our blog on our website as well. Um, so today's webinar is on globalisation and procurement, hosted by Katie. Um, Katie has been in procurement for over 20 years and she currently runs Aspire, um, which provides outsourced buying and professional procurement training. Um, she's also published eight books on procurement, most recently on sustainability, so we're in really good hands for today's webinar. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Katie, to get us started. Great stuff. Thanks very much, Anna. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this webinar this afternoon. So as Anna mentioned, I'm going to give you a brief presentation in relation to globalisation. I'm going to talk to you about the question as to whether globalisation is coming to an end for procurement. Presuming most of you are in or have an interest in procurement, the presentation is based around a procurement purchasing kind of field. So we're looking at globalisation from a sourcing and buying perspective. Sorry, Katie, you've just put yourself on. Sorry, <laughs> there we go. It happens, Good it name. happens. Apologies. So to get us started, with regards to global sourcing and offshoring, two terms that we use in procurement quite a lot. If you are working within procurement, you will be aware of these terms, I'm sure. So as an overview, global sourcing is a strategy that we use in procurement and it involves buying products and services from overseas. Overseas can be anywhere that isn't the country in which we are based, so any country abroad. Offshoring is slightly different to global sourcing. Offshoring is about moving a once home-based production facility to another country moving a facility to a country that offers materials and labour at a lower price. So the two do work hand in hand. When I'm talking about globalisation, and I'm using that term, I'm talking about global sourcing and I'm talking about offshoring. So those two come together as one. Now, the benefits that we've seen from global sourcing, offshoring, globalisation, are vast and we've seen the benefits for many years. As a procurement professional, I have taken advantage of significantly lower costs. If I'm buying something from another country, if I'm buying something from overseas, a lot of the time I'm doing that to save money. And this might be because the country I'm buying from has a slower economy than, than mine, it may be that the exchange rate is favourable, so I'm getting more for less in effect. And it may be that that country has got access to something that I haven't in a larger scale, which means that the price is lower. So that's the main reason historically and to this day that procurement professionals look to global source. Another benefit that we see and continue to see is that we gain an access to skilled labour. A lot of countries have got higher skilled people than we have in our own country. And I'm not just talking about the UK because I'm from the UK. I'm talking about globalisation from a variety of perspectives. It might be that someone in America is buying from China. It might be that someone in Africa is seeking to buy from Europe. Whichever way it works, there will be a benefit or there should be a benefit. And skilled labour is one of those things. Buying from overseas gives us access to labour that we probably haven't got at home. The third benefit is the benefit of lower raw material prices. If we are buying from another country, we're buying a commodity, a raw material, i.e. something that's extracted directly from the earth, 
it's often cheaper and more cost effective to buy that commodity from the country in which it originates. So if we're looking, for example, at buying diamonds, which would be a very nice job if we could do that for a living. But if we're looking at buying diamonds, we would probably look to get a competitive advantage if we bought from South Africa, for example, because we know that that's where there is an abundant supply of diamonds. It would be cheaper to do that than buy from a country that's imported them already. The fourth benefit that we may see is that there's an access to technology that we may not have in our home country. It might be if we're buying from overseas, that country is more technologically savvy than we are. It has access to something that we don't. And the final benefit is innovation. Other people in other countries might be doing things better, more efficiently, thinking outside the box and doing things a little bit better than we are. And we can take advantage of that. So here we can see that globalisation can offer several benefits and has offered several benefits. Whilst there are benefits of globalisation, global sourcing, offshoring, there's also risks. As we have been buying from overseas for many years as part of the procurement strategy, the risks have become quite accepted. We do look to mitigate against them, but normally the benefits, and historically, the benefits have been seen to be outweighing the risks. So as you can see on the slide, the risks of engaging with a global supply chain, they're well known. And in most cases, they're kind of accepted. We take the rough with the smooth. Here you can see some of the common risks. And some of the common risks might be that fluctuation in exchange rate. Similarly to if we're lucky enough to go on holiday, we take our money to the Bureau de Change, we think, fantastic, we're going to get a really good deal. And SOD's law, just as we go to change our money, the exchange rate drops and we don't get as much as we maybe hoped we would. It's the same in business. Sometimes we think we're going to get a better deal, but the exchange rate sometimes isn't going in our favour. It's a risk. It's something we just have to accept. There's another risk in relation to import and export costs and customs. When we are buying things in from another country, it's not that easy to get through customs. There's lots of paperwork, associated costs, and there's duties and tariffs that we have to pay. Again, it's an accepted risk because the lower price that we are paying normally outweighs the additional cost that we have to think about in relation to import and export. A big risk is in relation to ethical areas. And when I'm talking about ethical risks, I'm talking about modern slavery, child labour, poor working conditions, minimum pay, health and safety. In some countries across the world, there are issues with regards to working conditions. So whilst we are aware of those issues, we probably know that the conditions aren't as good as we would have in our own country. We've come to accept the fact that that's almost normal in some of the countries that we buy from. That doesn't mean we think it's right. That doesn't mean we're not working hard to try and eradicate things like modern slavery and child labour. But over the last 30, 40 years through the globalisation period, it's become almost accepted. There's issues that we need to consider in relation to sustainability. Sustainability in relation to making sure that we're protecting the planet on which we live. So if, for example, we're involved in buying paper products, for example, and we're buying paper products from Norway, for example, we need to make sure that we're working with suppliers that are engaged to repopulate those trees that they're felling to make the paper. There is issues with sustainability, with extracting raw materials and not replenishing. So that's something that is a risk within globalisation. IPR infringements relate to intellectual property rights. Here we're talking about things like concerns of people stealing our copyrights, our patents, our designs. 
some countries, and I'm not going to name countries, I don't want to offend anyone on the call, but some countries are known or have a reputation for borrowing other people's ideas and making copies of them. So this is an infringement of intellectual property. It's a risk. If we give a specification to an overseas supplier and we ask them to make it for us, there's a chance that they might copy it and also make it for themselves. It's much harder to manage an overseas supplier in relation to any of these risks than one that's on your doorstep that you can get in the car, the train, pop and see relatively quickly. And the final risk is the risk of quality concerns. Again, because of the geographical distance between us as the procurement organisation and the supplier, it's harder to understand and monitor quality. It's often a risk that when products come in from overseas, there may be a few defects within that shipment. But with all of these risks, globalisation has almost got us around to a way of thinking that we can accept these risks because the benefits that we're getting far outweigh them. And that's how it has been. So just to summarise, the benefits have historically outweighed the risks. And until 2020, the global supply chain, globalisation, performed well for all parties, for the buyer, for the supplier and for the consumer. Everyone was relatively happy. Global supply chains allowed consumers to buy at low costs. It allowed them to get products at a relatively low price. Things like reduced price clothing. And it enabled us to have access to good quality and advanced technology. So some real benefits there for us as a consumer. This trend of globalisation, it helps to develop some countries. Taiwan, Singapore, China, the one that a lot of us think about with regards to globalisation and outsourcing. It really helped develop these countries. The amount of money that some of the Western world was putting into some of these countries has really helped them to flourish. Without the investment from America, the UK, for example, would China, Taiwan, Singapore be where they are today? Now, I don't know the answer, but if I was asked on the spot, I would probably say no, they wouldn't be, because we, as the UK and other forward-thinking countries over the last 50 years, have really supported the development. But the point of this presentation really is to think about, are the days of reaping these benefits of globalisation coming to an end? So the challenges that we've seen in recent years, global supply chains and global sourcing has faced some real challenges in recent times. We've faced things like force majeure. And when I say force majeure, I'm talking about an unforeseen event or an act of God is another way of describing force majeure. It might be a flash flood, a hurricane, it could be an earthquake, a volcanic eruption, it could be war, it could be COVID. Something that we aren't expecting is classified as force majeure. And we can probably all think of a couple of things that have affected us both professionally and privately that we weren't expecting in recent years. We also had the Suez Canal blockage. So something that Anna and I were speaking briefly about before I started the presentation, something that was quite heavily covered in the media, and this issue really affected the global supply chain. And the picture you can see here is a uh, shot from above. All of those little colored blocks are actually containers and they're containers full of hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of items on that ship that's stuck for whatever reason. That's the conversation for another day. But the fact that the ship couldn't get through pretty much halted the supply chain in many countries. So the positives of buying from a global supply chain that I outlined before automatically come to a halt because we can't get our products. They're stuck on that ship. It was a massive challenge for procurement. That said, these type of challenges are relatively infrequent, were relatively infrequent. And us as procurement professionals in the main were able to make provisions to secure the products elsewhere so that eventually we could meet the demand. 
So with regards to our products that were maybe stuck in the Suez Canal, we were able to try and find an alternative supply. We were able to continue production if we were in manufacturing or retail if we were on the high street. We were buying stuff from somewhere else. So we managed. It was something we could cope with, although it was far from ideal. So none of these three things will be a surprise to anyone, I would expect. But since 2020, more challenges have presented themselves. We're all aware of COVID. It's been a global problem. It still is a global problem. Brexit for UK and European people has been and still is a bit of an issue. And then, of course, and sadly, we've got the war in Ukraine that's going on as a current issue, which, again, everyone will be aware of. These three challenges, and these are just three of several, but three that I've picked because I think the people on the webinar will be aware of them, regardless of geographical location. But these challenges are far more deep rooted and these are destined to have a longer lasting and more serious consequence on the supply chain than those mentioned in the previous slide. The force majeure aspects and the Suez Canal, whilst a problem at the time, came, we dealt with them and they've gone. COVID, we can't really say it's gone, we've dealt with it, we're dealing with it every day. Brexit, the same. We're still dealing with the fallout from Brexit and the war in Ukraine is very much current and Lord only knows how long it's going to go on for. It's something that unfortunately, it's a macro factor, it's an external factor, it's out of our control. So the possible problem that we may have to consider in spring of last year, this year, sorry, getting a bit excited, thought it was Christmas already, we're into the new year. So in spring of 2022, the UK Treasury, the US Treasury Secretary called on America and Europe to reduce its reliance on China and Russia as supply partners. So the US Treasury Secretary, she suggested that procurement professionals moved business away from strategic rivals, i.e. China and Russia, and placed it with allies instead. So what she's saying here in this statement, and quite a brave and sweeping statement really, is that we shouldn't be relying on China. We shouldn't be relying on Russia. We shouldn't be working and boosting the supply chain with countries that promote things that aren't positive in the world based on the war in Russia and the regime that China runs. So this means that it was suggested that we as procurement professionals move a lot of our business, a lot of our supply chains away from countries that offer us the low costs, because China and Russia are two of those countries that we really do seek benefits from. And we move the supply to countries that really add value to our products. We consider also reshoring as part of this. So at the beginning, I spoke about offshoring, which is moving our manufacturing organizations to a low cost country. But what the US Treasury Secretary is saying that the world should do is bring everything back home. So if we have looked to put an operation in China or Russia or anywhere for a low cost reason, we should now be looking at pulling that back. So if, for example, in the UK, we'd looked to offshore our car manufacturing to China, we should look at pulling those batteries back and doing everything back in the UK. This is the view, the suggestion of the US Treasury Secretary. So why? What was the thinking behind this? Now, sadly, I haven't had a chance to speak to her. I very much doubt she'd pick up the phone to little old me if I were to, to ring her. But my logic really behind this is that she wants us to support something called friend shoring. Bit of a funny word. But friend shoring is working with countries that foster peace and diplomacy rather than those that operate strict regimes and promote violence and war. So what she's saying here is we should work with the countries that represent good ethical practices, good sustainable practices, rather than working with the countries that offer us the lowest cost. It's ethically a really good suggestion. It's potentially the end of globalization. If we do what she's saying, 
we stop working with those supply chains overseas and we do everything with our own organization in our own country and with the countries that are really close to us, both geographically and politically connectedly. But is that somewhat naive? What she's asking for, and I can appreciate it's ethically brilliant, but would it work in practice? And this is where we start discussing whether globalization is gonna to come to an end or not. Is it a practical suggestion to think that we could work purely based on friend shoring rather than with a global supply chain? So if we think about friend shoring, working with those countries that are close to us geographically and that are operating in a peaceful climate, the benefits we see is that all people, all countries in the supply chain are working in peaceful times. And that would be great. There's less likelihood of supplier disruption. That's a benefit. Because if we're not engaging with countries that have strict regimes or potentially are going to war, then the products are just going to flow through the supply chain. There's not going to be the issue of, horrific as it sounds, an airport being bombed or a roadblock because we can't get out of that country because they don't agree with our political beliefs. So there is less likelihood of su supplier disruption if we go down the US Treasury's view. Another benefit of French shoring is the low levels of political unrest. Countries that are allies to each other normally have very similar political views. So the chances of political unrest occurring are minimized. This results in a stable trading environment. And ultimately, as a procurement professional, that's what we want. We want to know if we place a purchase order on someone, that supplier is going to supply the goods and services without any problems. Continuity of supply is paramount. There would be enhanced relationships if we went down the friend shoring route because people are likely to be of the same beliefs, of the same culture, so the relationships are more likely to flourish naturally without us having to put so much hard work in. The next point there is shared culture. So with regards to friend shoring, it's more likely that people will have the same values, the same visions. People are more likely to have the same views on religion, political practices. So the shared culture would enhance the relationship. And then you've got the reduced lead time. So the reduced time from placing your purchase order to physically receiving your goods or services. Because you're working with countries that are geographically closer to you and their allies, people are gonna work harder and things are gonna arrive quicker in theory. So it's a great concept in theory. It's very pink and fluffy and everyone's happy. Everyone's working together. There's no political unrest. There's no war. Everybody's friends with everyone. Sounds fantastic. But would it actually work? Now, this is just my opinion. And I'm sure people on the call on the webinar have probably got a difference of opinion. And hopefully we can have a chat later on if we've got some questions at the end. But my view is whilst it's a great concept to support only countries that are allies and countries that share trade with each other are friend shoring, I don't really think it's gonna be that successful. Think about everything that we need to buy in our supply chain. Can we actually get everything we need from our allies? So as the UK, if we're just working with our allies countries, bearing in mind at the moment, Russia, unfortunately, is not an ally. Can we get everything we need? I don't think we can. Not consistently, not sustainably. The one thing that springs to mind is wheat. We know how much wheat Russia and the Ukraine produce. A massive amount of the world's supply comes out of Russia and Ukraine moment there's the issue whereby we're struggling to get it if we're getting it at all and it's driving up the prices so for those of you that go and buy bread from the supermarket you may have seen that the price has gone quite high quite quickly other wheat-based products pasta for example some beers anything that has a wheat-based product in it 
is going up in price. And that's because we're not able to get the volume that we need due to the problems in Ukraine and Russia. So at the moment, even after the short period of time that the Russian war has been going on, we can see just with that one example that the price is going up. And the price is going up because demand is exceeding supply. More people want the product than the product is available. So at the moment, it's he or she who pays most gets the product. If we're not getting it out of Russia and Ukraine, we're having to buy it from someone else. If we only had our allies to choose from, would we be able to get enough wheat to fulfill our need? Long term, possibly not, because there's going to be a lot of other countries going down the same route. If everyone stops buying from Russia and Ukraine, that massive percentage of grain that they currently supply, there's going to be a void. How is that going to be fulfilled? So think about other things that you maybe need. Think about things you buy from other countries and think about whether you can get them in your own country. For me, personally, a problem could be chocolate. We buy cocoa beans from the Ivory Coast. Are they an ally? Probably not. So if we went down this theory of French shoring, where's the cocoa bean going to come from? How's Katie going to get her chocolate? It's going to be a bit of a problem. So I know that's a little bit tongue in cheek and I'm not trying to make light of a serious situation, but just have a think about what products you buy or you know are imported, either in your professional or your private life. And if we didn't buy from overseas, could we get everything we needed? My answer is probably not, not in the long term. So the final question I've got on there, it's similar, it relates to the theme. Does the home country have the capacity to ensure continuity of supply? If we're not buying cocoa beans from the Ivory Coast or wherever we might be buying them from, is it likely that the UK is going to suddenly be able to, to start growing cocoa? Are we going to be able to harvest the beans, cook the beans? Are we going to be able to make enough chocolate to fulfil the demand in the UK from those beans? The way I eat chocolate? Probably not. So things to think about with regards to French shoring versus globalisation. Is it not true that global sourcing benefits both the supplying organisation and the buying organisation? In my view, at the moment, both countries are benefiting. If I'm buying something from China, China is benefiting because it's getting my money. And I'm benefiting because I'm getting a product at a lower cost than I would if I were making it or buying it in my own country. So it's what we call a win-win situation at the moment. The buying company, as I've said, is achieving a lower cost. The supplying organization is gaining a higher price from us or from their, their buyer than they would if they were supplying it to people in their own country. So even though we're getting a better deal, the supplier is still making more money selling to us, exporting, than they would if they sold internally. So everyone's winning with the current way we're doing things financially. The orders from the buying country help to keep the employee levels up in the supplying countries. So something else to think about, if we are engaging in globalization, we're actually helping those countries' economies. If we weren't putting loads of orders over to Taiwan in the 70s and 80s for stereos and videos and various other music systems and TVs, a lot of those people that worked in those countries probably wouldn't have had a job. We've helped to develop those countries in their manufacturing by placing orders on them. So with overseas orders coming in, supplying organisations can contribute positively towards their economy and it can help to develop their country's financial situation. So things to think about, at the moment, globalization, it is helping, it is helping both sides, both parties. If we do what our friend in America wants us to do, the US Treasury, and if we do go down the French shoring route, and we just buy from our local companies and our suppliers that are allies to us from local countries, 
then potentially the global supply chains will dissolve. And ultimately those economies in those countries will suffer. If we aren't putting orders on to Russia, if we aren't buying oil out of the Middle East, where's their money gonna come from? If everyone adopted this approach, there's gonna be some countries that export that really have got a financial problem. Economies that we've been contributing towards and building up for almost 50 years while we've been promoting globalization would potentially start to fail. So all that good work that we've done is gonna be undone if we went solely down the friend shoring route. So what options do we have? Whilst easy, it's easy to see how shortening supply chains, i.e. keeping things local, can in theory offer a more stable procurement option, would this work in reality? So within our home countries, if we're doing everything ourselves and with a few close allies, do we have the investors? Do we have the people to put money into the supply chain? Do we have all the skills that we need? Do we have the ability to access all the materials? Can we rebuild all of the manufacturing that we used to do in our home country? So 20, 30 years ago, within the UK, for example, it was a thriving manufacturing company, country. Sorry, The UK made cars. It made all sorts. We had coal industries. We had a multitude of things that we haven't got now because we've embraced globalization. And in doing that, we've almost killed off a lot of the skill set that we once had. So if we were to rebuild and go down the French shoring route, if we were to start all the manufacturing back up in the UK, do we have the geographical space? Do we have the brown land and the green land to actually rebuild all these factories? Do we reopen the ones that have been mothballed for 30 years? Do we have enough people that we can call on that have got the skills to start this going again? Potentially, I would suggest we probably don't. And in that respect, we've maybe shot ourselves in the foot because if we did want to bring everything back in-house, don't think it's really gonna work. It's not a quick fix. Something else to think about is do we want to sever all the ties with global suppliers? If we go down the French shoring route, if globalization comes to an end, do we really want to say to all the suppliers that we've worked with in Russia, in China, in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East, do we want to say, thanks very much, but we don't want to work with you anymore? Do we just want to walk away? What risks would that give to our supply chain? Potentially huge risks. If we walk away from these suppliers, we're going to have a lot of voids in the things that we have come to know and love as part of our daily and professional life. Do we want to risk what commodities we can source? If we walk away from these suppliers that don't share the same values as us, that don't operate the same ethical standards that we need, do we have the assurance that we can still get the commodities? No, we don't. Think about oil, for example. If we truly went down the French shoring route and walked away from globalization, would we be able to get enough crude oil in this country or one's own country to fulfill demand? Now, I'm no crude oil expert, but I'm pretty sure that there's not a lot left in the UK that we can drill for. And the amount that we use for industry, for our private life, is significant. So if we did walk away from some of these countries, we wouldn't be able to get things like oil, gas, we wouldn't be able to get wheat, we wouldn't be able to get cocoa beans. There's so many things that we wouldn't be able to get. And do we want to risk economic sanctions? So working with countries that don't share the same values as us, it might not be ideal, so working with countries like Russia at the moment, it's far from ideal, I understand that. But is it actually worth, in some instances, keeping that relationship going, helping to keep the peace as a form of protection for our own country? 
if we were to withdraw everything that we were buying from a country that's at war, would that maybe fuel the fire? Would that maybe put us on the hit list of a country that's at war and say, actually, hypothetically, the UK are really annoying us now. All that money we used to get from them, they've pulled all that out. So do we then become a potential victim? Do we become someone on their list that they want to go to war with? So there's a lot of things to think about. It's not just cost. It's not just price. It's about the political and the economic potential risks that we expose ourselves to if we go down that route that the US Treasury lady suggests we do. And again, this is just my personal opinion. There's maybe a lot more merit in doing what she suggests than, than I can see with my experience. But I see that if we did go down the French or in route, we are opening ourselves up to quite a lot of risk. So within this theory within is globalization coming to an end, what does the future look like? Whilst there's a somewhat valid argument for ending globalization, so the arguments for better ethical conduct, working with our allies, promoting good working relationships with people that are geographically close to us. At the present time, the risks of doing this, in my opinion, are so much higher than keeping the status quo. At the current time, we need global supply chains. We need lower cost labor. We need access to, to worldwide resources. And as such, we need to maintain and continue to develop relationships with our overseas suppliers. Particularly with the current cost of living crisis, for which I'm sure we're all aware, removing the globalization element of procurement and supply would only further drive up costs. So if we did that, again, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So moving forward, in my opinion, globalization is likely to continue and it's likely to continue as we've known it for some time. But we need to take some steps as procurement professionals. We need to continue buying from the overseas suppliers. We need Katie to still have her chocolate, that's a fact. But we need to manage the risks. We need to make sure that we're promoting good ethical conduct. We need to make sure that the supply chains aren't engaging in poor ethical practice. We need to try and eradicate modern slavery from the supply chain, child labor, all those bad things. We need to appreciate that as the world becomes more turbulent, and inevitably it will through climate change, probably more political conflict and war, unfortunately, there's going to be some risks of continuity of supply. There's going to be some breaks in the fact that we can't always get what we want when we want it. So to overcome that, let's consider holding some buffer stock where possible. Let's consider holding an additional amount of what we need, that just in case factor in case there's another COVID outbreak, in case there's a war. Now we can't hold everything we need just in case, but by holding some buffer stock in some situations, it gives us almost a head start. We don't run out straight away. It's really important to make our business indispensable to the overseas suppliers. So if we can do things like paying on time, make sure we're a good company to deal with, make ourselves attractive to the suppliers, then they're going to want to work with us. If we're important to them, that means we are more likely to get what we want when we want it, and there's not going to be any issues. Maybe we think about building some extended lead times into the supply chain. Again, it's that just in case factor. If we know that there's political unrest, if we know there's problems, then we maybe give our suppliers a little more notice we give some extra time to ensure that we don't run out of stuff. We have a contingency plan. We have a backup plan. So yes, we're still buying from overseas. Yes, we are still engaging with some countries that maybe we don't agree with their regime and their way of working 100%, but we are still working with them. If it all goes wrong, what are we going to do? So maybe we have a contingency plan and maybe that contingency plan is about dual sourcing. 
it's about maybe working with two or three suppliers instead of just one supplier. So if there is an issue, i.e. there's a problem getting grain out of Russia, we've got another supplier in America that we know we can get it from. Again, it's all very good in theory. Practically, it's not going to work for everybody in every role, but it's something to consider. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Develop a plan for unexpected um, supply and demand issues. So again, this is linking into contingency and risk mitigation. If something happens, if we can't get what we want when we want it, what are we going to do? Have we got a go-to supplier that can help us? Have we got a substitute product? What do we tell our customers? What do we tell our consumers? Develop a plan. So if something goes wrong, we're not caught completely off guard. And again, easier said than done. We haven't all got a crystal ball. I can't say what's going to happen next week, next year. But if we've got a rough idea of a plan, it puts us in a better position to be able to manage the potential problems. And really importantly, we need to continue to develop the relationships. We need to continue to develop the relationships we have with these overseas suppliers. Yes, culturally, they might be different. Yes, we might not necessarily agree with the way the country is run, with a regime, with the fact that a country is at war with another country. But we almost need to put our personal views aside for the um, development of the supply chain. We can continue to build strong professional relationships, even if we don't necessarily agree with what's going on in that country. And building that professional procurement relationship will contribute to ensuring that we get those products and services, that we get that continuity of supply from our overseas suppliers. So I'll open up to questions and discussion in a moment, but to summarize really, Whilst I fully appreciate the US Treasury's view to maybe almost boycott working with countries that, that aren't playing the game, if you like, and to stop globalization as we know it, when we drill down and when we really think about it, the situation that we found ourselves in, as the UK, for example, is one where if we did stop globalization, we wouldn't get what we want, we wouldn't function it would be significantly detrimental to our economy. Because you imagine if we can't get oil, if we can't get gas, if we can't get rice, if we can't get flour, if we can't get grain, we stop. So we need those overseas countries as much as they need us. So my closing statement before I open to questions is that I think globalization needs to continue. It's something that we need to continue to develop Yes, we need to work on the ethical elements. Yes, we need to try and not promote the fact that war is going on, but we need to understand that we need the whole world in order to fulfill the demand to keep us accustomed to the lifestyle with which we've become used to. And that's me, Anna, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you so much, Katie. That was really interesting. Um, I will, yes, yeah, so we'll open the floor to questions. Um, you can put the questions either in the chat or you can use the Q&A function. Either one of those is more than fine. Um, just while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I had a question, if that's okay, Katie. Of course, yeah, of course. Um, so I was wondering kind of um, for, in a practical sense, for people working in procurement, mm -hmm. um, how would you advise them to develop relationships with suppliers who have significant cultural differences? So especially if they're working with um, a country whose regime, their own country doesn't support, like the UK and Russia. It's obviously yeah. quite a, a, a delicate balance, I, I would imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's difficult. Um, it, it is difficult, and this is why procurement is quite a skilled profession, and in my view, a profession that probably doesn't get the kudos that it that it deserves. To answer your question, Anna, I think for me, and again, based on my experience and having worked with people globally with significantly different cultures to me, try and find at least one professional common area as a starting point. So that would be what I would suggest. Trying to find a personal link is going to be hard because we're probably poles apart and 
if you think at the moment, if we wanted to develop a relationship with someone in Russia, Russia are going to be very protective over what their country is doing, and we're probably going to have a polar opposite view. So park that initially and find a professional goal. That professional goal might be that we want to do business with that supplier. We want to pay them. They want to supply us. As basic as that. Start small. Let that relationship then evolve. Show ourselves to be a good buying organisation. Follow the process. Make sure we adhere to the contract. And you'll probably find that over time, you will find some synergies between your lifestyles. And you can probably then start to get to the stage where you say to someone, did you have a nice weekend? And although that sounds really basic, when you first engage with someone that has a significantly different culture to you, you don't even know if they work weekends or what they might be doing at the weekend. So start small with a small professional goal and just use it like building blocks and build, build, build. That's what I've done. I'm still here, thankfully, after 20 odd years. So that, that would be my advice. No, that's great. Thank you. So keep it work related because obviously that's where all the initial common ground is in the first place. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Brilliant. Well, um, oh, we've got another question uh, from Zenon. Um, they'd like to know whether um, ending globalisation will become a trend in a decade. OK, good question. Um, I personally think there's going to be quite a lot of talk about this in, in the next five or six years. So I think people are going to probably try and stop globalisation. I do think there will probably be a couple of countries that say, right, we're boycotting working with XYZ uh, companies in XYZ countries because we want to be self-sufficient. Some countries will be better at it than others. Obviously, some countries have, have got access to different commodities than, than others. But realistically, I think we've come so far in a consumer world where we now expect to have anything and everything at the click of a button or on the shelf that if we were to end globalization in 10 years, it, it just wouldn't work. So in summary, to, to answer your question, I genuinely don't think it will come to an end. I think it's going to continue. I think it has to continue unless we all decide to go sort of back to how people lived 100 years ago when you all had a little bit of land, a cow, a sheep, and you were happy with your lot. But as we want more as human beings and we want more experiences, we want the um, most up to date technology. I think we're only going to get that if we keep engaging in globalization. Perfect. Thank you, Katie. Um, I can see Amadou, you've raised your hand. Um, do, if you have a question, do you want to put it in the chat um, or the Q&A? Either of those um, would, be, would be perfect. Um, we will be sending out um, the recording of this webinar, so you'll all receive that um, in the next few days. Uh, it will also be on our blog as well, so you can find it through our website. Um, if you do have any questions that you forget to ask now or you think of later, um, you can get in contact with us and I'll put our details in the chat. Um, don't think anything's come through from Amadou yet, so I'll just our details in the chat there so feel free to drop us an email or fill out our inquiry form there um and just have a look if any more questions have come through doesn't look like it uh, well if you have enjoyed today's um webinar and you're interested in kind of finding out more um furthering your career in procurement um we do offer courses in procurement so we offer courses from SIPS, so that's the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. Um, some of you may probably already be doing a course with us, um, or you may be interested in it. Um, again, if you are, just get in touch with us using those links. Um, I'm just about to send through, um, and we can, we can be happy to help you. Don't think anything else has come through. Um, I'll just ask one more question just in case. Um, I wondered, Katie, whether there are any kind of particular production areas that the UK could expand or reawaken. Um, I know there's been 
uh, recently has been attempts to kind of expand oil and gas production, but I don't think we know how successful that's going to be yet, if if at all, really. Agreed, agreed. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could actually become a little bit more self-sufficient? That that probably would be be really good. But I think because we are almost without sounding rude, we're quite greedy as consumers now and, and we want everything so fast and we want so much of it, then I don't think we've got the capacity to meet the demand. To answer your question directly, Anna, I think one industry that we may see popping back, having a go, is probably car manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I, I think that may be something. There's still a lot of mothball sites in areas, I mean, Luton, in Bedfordshire, um, the Midlands, the West Midlands, where it was really, really um, heavy on, on car manufacturing, you know, in sort of the 70s and the 80s. That is something I've heard a few people talk about at various events I've been to, whether the generation of the electric car can work in the UK. I don't know. Do we need that more advanced thinking, those innovative solutions that are currently overseas? It, it really does depend. I mean, I wish I had a crystal ball, but I think for me at the moment, due to the fact that we're so focused on cost and price, we're probably still going to keep going and buying from those countries that are quite or not quite as developed as we are in order to keep the costs down. But if there was one, I would think probably um, car manufacturing would be one that would probably be the easiest and the simplest to bring back. OK, brilliant. Thank you. That was really useful. Um, so nothing more has come through. So we'll, we'll um, end here for today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who joined. We really hope that you found it interesting and informative. Um, again, you'll receive the webinar um, in the next couple of days, so you can watch back the recording. Um, and please, if you do have any questions, just get in touch. We're more than happy to help. Um, so thank you to everyone who's joined. Thank you, of course, to Katie. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, Thanks, and I hope Anna. you all have a lovely day. Thanks very much. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.